Metatron, he who is above the angels, according to medieval rabbis, either consubstantial with the Ancient of Days, or perhaps his chief agent, or perhaps just an aspect of his appearance in the world, and if those uh, sound like categories of um, Trinit Trinitarian theology, respectively, orthodox and heretical, um, it's not accidental, has become a figure of greater and greater interest among scholars of Jewish and Christian history in the last decades. Particularly vexed, it seems, has been the question of his historical link with Jesus the Christ. Peter Schaefer recently caricatured the controversy in ways that nonetheless will help to introduce it. And I quote, Enoch turned Metatron, the highest angel in heaven and the lesser God, that is Y-H-W-H uh, Hakatan, the small figures prominently in the Merkava mystical book Three Enoch and, of all places, the Babylonian Talmud. His appearance in Three Enoch in particular has led some scholars to establish an unbroken connection between the three books of Enoch and to argue for an early Jewish Metatron tradition that helped shape the Christian notion of Jesus as the second and younger God next to his divine father, end quote. Putting the point even more sharply, Schaefer has also written, quote, Therefore, it seems unlikely that the Jewish concept of Metatron as the lesser Yahweh exerted any influence on the emergence and crystallization of the Christian doctrine, a possibility that Christoph Marxis recently mapped out as an important avenue of future research. In fact, quite the opposite, says Schaefer. Instead of regarding three Enoch's Metatron as part of the fabric from which the doctrine of the Trinity was woven, we do better to understand the figure of Metatron as an answer to the New Testament's message of Jesus Christ, end quote. Christoph Marx's canon will no doubt explicate and defend his own position. But since I am the some scholars identified by Schaefer in the footnotes to the first citation, let me begin here by stating categorically that I have never held the position attributed to me, the somewhat ridiculous position, to the effect that the figure of Metatron lies in the background of Christology, nor yet the even more ridiculous notion that something from three Enoch could be a source for Trinitarian theology. On the other hand, the stark alternative that Schaefer presents here that Metatron came into the world as an answer, emphasis original, and an imitation of Jesus the Christ seems to me equally impossible to maintain. What I have claimed clearly and repeatedly is that both Jesus Christ, the son of man of the gospels, and Enoch become, and Enoch become Metatron, proceed from closely related, very ancient sources within the mythology of the people of Israel, including especially sources from the literature called, in latter days, apocalyptic. In these lectures, then, I would like to correct the record, articulate more fully what I have really said on these matters, correct my position, my former position as well, where I deem necessary, and fill it out into the fullest statement of my thesis. So, the quest of the historical Metatron. Part one, two powers in heaven. Increasingly over the last two decades, some scholars have been noting and taking seriously the similarity between certain representations of the divine realm in texts that we call Jewish and in texts that we call Christian. This, to use a crude shorthand, involves an implication that there are two divine sovereignties in heaven sharing in some sense or other power or sovereignty. After the third century or so, this ancient set of Jewish beliefs was to be named by the rabbis the heresy of two sovereignties in heaven. While, on the other hand, these representations of the divine neither in their non-Christian nor in their Christian forms, do not violate Second Temple notions of monotheism, 
which always allowed for subordinate divinities. That Malach Hashem, who appears all over the Torah, ambiguously identified or not with the Lord himself. The rabbinic movement can, to a certain extent, be understood as a theological reform movement that seeks to purify Jewish thinking of the notion that there are two powers or two sovereignties in heaven. That which we habitually take, therefore, as the single most salient difference between an essentialized Judaism and an equally essentialized Christianity turns out to be the product of inner Jewish struggle rather than an originary difference. This perspective, having been offered by me in a series of publications, needs defense now in the light of Peter Schaeffer's recent concerted total rejection thereof, including in this very, I believe, in this very room. For this picture, Schaeffer substitutes an originary difference between Judaism and Christianity on this issue, with the observed similarities developing only at the end of late antiquity in the Bavli, that is the Babylonian Talmud, and its environment under the influence of Christianity and in response to that. His view is part and parcel of his position explicitly stated elsewhere that much of the energy of the Babylonian rabbis was devoted to a war to the death, his language, between Judaism and Christianity, in which all means, fair and foul, might be employed. There is thus much at stake in this debate. I do not deny the possibility or reality of such contacts between Babylonian Amoraim and Christians. I have already presented the case for very strong and rich connections of that sort. I will revisit here some of the earlier arguments for independent rabbinic tr transmission of certain topoi regarding the nature of the Messiah, evidence that does not suggest latter-day Christian influence on the Babylonian rabbis, but instead continuity between Second Temple Apocalyptic and the Talmud. I will also provide entirely new arguments for the cognizance of apocalyptic themes and forms in the time of the rabbis, that is, from the time of the Mishnah, early third century AD, through the redaction of the Babylonian Talmud, 7th century AD, that's my best guess for the redaction. The Mishnah is dated, the Talmud. Indeed, I will argue that the second chapter of Tractate Chagiga in the Bavli consists largely of the remnants of a probably oral rabbinic apocalypse that links second temple apocalypse to the Byzantine era Merkaba texts. For the usual term, mystical collection, I would substitute the term Talmudic Apocalypse. Gershom Sholem, by now notoriously, made some remarkable claims about Byzantine-era Hebrew visionary theosophical texts known as the Heichalot. Essentially, he claimed, on the basis of Talmudic legendary evidence, that there was a robust esoteric tradition among the Tanaim, that is the early Palestinian rabbis, or even the Pharisees, of first century Palestine, of which we find the contents in the Heichalot collections several centuries later. This concept was supported by him via a drastic, increasingly so, predating of these texts to the fourth, the fifth, I wrote in parentheses, the minor fall, the major lift, I couldn't resist, <laughs> and even earlier centuries. I'm gonna leave it in for the printed version. For Sholem then, there is virtually, unbroke, an, uh, virtually unbroken chain of tradition from books like Enoch through the alleged Tanaitic conventicles and into the very early Hechelot literature. This construction, accepted by many if not most scholars, initially was challenged by E.E. E. Orbach in an article, indeed the lead article, in the Festschrift for Sholem's 70th birthday, published in 1967. Right? It's um, one of the um, remarkable features of Jerusalem scholarly life, especially in Talmudic circles, as documented in the movie Footnote, is that when one is invited to a fest trip, to write a fest trip for a long time colleague, one does so by attacking that colleague's <laughs> positions. That's... In this article, Orbach definitively demonstrates his conclusion that, quote, 
in the apocalyptic visions, and as we shall see also in the Hechalot literature, there is nothing that can teach us about the essence or the content of the teachings of the Tanaim in the matter of the Merkava beyond that which is found in the tradition of the rabbis itself. In other words, directly countering Sholem's argument that we can reconstruct the content of Tanaitic mystical life by looking at the literature produced uh, in the Byzantine era, Orbach denies that completely. He quite thoroughly disproves Sholem's thesis vis-a-vis -vis the Tanaim. Sholem had made, however, two separable claims. The first is that there is a direct connection between the apocalyptic literature of the Second Temple and the Hechalot. And the second is that this connection is manifest in the Tanaitic narratives of the teaching of the Maasei Merkava and the story of the four who entered the grove. It is only the second of these that Orbach attacked. As Sholem himself had written, quote, a good deal of the material in the Hechalot undoubtedly pertains to later stages of development in which older motifs have acquired a new significance or revealed new aspects. If the roots in many cases go far back, they do not necessarily go back to these orthodox rabbinic teachers of the Mishnaic period. This is uh, Sholem himself qualifying his claims. right? So I'm suggesting that the way he's portrayed in much of the latter literature is actually a kind of caricature of Sholem's position, which was much more uh, nuanced. Subterranean but effective and occasionally still traceable connections exist between these later mystics and the groups which produced a large proportion of the pseudepigrapha and the apocalypses of the first century before and after Christ. Still Sholem. Subsequently, a good deal of this unrecognized tradition made its way to later generations independent of and often in isolation from the schools and academies of the Talmudic teachers, end quote. Thus, it would be possible to completely agree with Orbach that, quote, the lecture and the study of Maase Merkava in its original Tanaitic formulation is as far as east from west from the imaginative compositions about ascent in the Hellenistic apocalyptic literature and in the later Merkava literature, end quote, and still to assert that the Second Temple apocalyptic literature is connected historically in some way, shape, or fashion with the Hechalot. Indeed, Orbach himself made this explicit, writing, the utmost closeness between the Hechalot literature and the circles that created the ancient apocryphal literature is obvious. The interpretation of the Tanaitic texts can be sequestered from the question of extant and developing apocalyptic speculation among Jews manifest in the Hechalot, and large parts of Sholem's original thesis remain in play after Orbach. The reason and justification for lectures on the sources of Byzantine-era Jewish mysticism as the Kent Schaefer Lectures is that that mystic tradition bears a very complicated relation with Christology. Drawing on the same Second Temple traditions, I would maintain, two related but very distinct versions of a binatarian theology developed among the Jewish groups that evolved into Christianity and the Jewish groups, or rather some of them, that did not. In recent years, some extreme claims have been advanced to the effect that essentially all of the central themes of the Byzantine visionary tradition of the Jews were developed in response to and under the direct impact of Christianity. Thus, as we have seen above, Peter Schaefer has written, Hence, I would like to turn the tables and suggest that instead of seeing three Enoch's Metatron as part of the fabric from which the New Testament Jesus emerged, who claimed that? We tried to understand the figure of Metatron as an answer to the New Testament's message of Jesus Christ. Schaefer's point of view has been recently reaffirmed by Klaus Herrmann, who writes, uh, quote, I too assume that the Metatron tradition in three Enoch can be seen as a response to the Christian worldview, end quote. This extreme position developed to be sure as antithesis to Sholem's equally extreme and equally implausible thesis according to which the Jewish texts were directly and almost exclusively related diachronically to the apocalyptic texts of the Second Temple period. 
and an alleged visionary mysticism of the early rabbinic Tanaitic period, which Orbach had, uh, in any case, discredited. I wish to propose a third way of thinking about the roots and roots, that is R-O-O-T-S and R-O-U-T-E-S, right? the roots and roots of Jewish binetarianism in late antiquity, including among the rabbis and in rabbinic literature. Instead of one extreme view, Sholem's and Orbach's, that posits lines of unbroken continuity between Second Temple apocalyptic and Hechelot literature, or another, equally extreme one, Peter Schaeffer's, according to which binetarian speculation about Metatron is entirely the product of a rivalrous response to Christianity in the Byzantine era, I propose a third way, to wit, that while there is nearly incontrovertible evidence for the interchange between Christian and Jewish circles in late antiquity, there is also good evidence for the circulation of apocalyptic traditions among Jews through the rabbinic period, independently of specific Christian contexts. Right? That is, in a sentence, the argument of the whole set of three lectures. There is no reason in the world to assume only one possible cultural frame within which Hechalot came to be. And there are many gradations between hermetic, in both senses, transmission among Jews alone of an unchanging doctrine, on the one hand, or an Enoch Mittatron figure revamped, so to speak, from an image of Christ, on the other. We should imagine the development of these motifs in the Hechalot literature and the Talmud via a process of bricolage, including traditions from the Second Temple, deployed and redeployed in different particular historical contexts, and encompassing as well the distinct and real possibility of a Christological context at various junctures in its development. Images of the Byzantine or Sassanid courts at others. We have no need to posit hidden and forgotten conventicles in which apocalyptic material was transmitted. For I will show that we find it hidden in plain sight, right in the Babylonian Talmud. The bricolage model would allow one to incorporate compelling arguments for the particular impact of particular texts or themes known from Christian sources, such as that of Annette Reed in reference to Sinkelis, and a particular uncharacteristic passage in Sefer Hechalot without implying in the slightest that all the Metatron material came from the Christians. In order, however, to dispel any misunderstanding of my position here, let it be stated clearly and upfront. I continue to maintain the view that I have espoused for decades of intimate, creative, ironic, and polemical sharing between the Jews and Christians in late antiquity. Indeed, most recently, I have argued at length that a shared topos of Talmudic and patristic theology, namely the coming of the Messiah only after all the souls made at creation will have lived in bodies, can best, or perhaps only, be understood as the product of religious interaction between Babylonian rabbis and Cappadocian fathers. I needn't rehearse the argument here, but only refer to it to demonstrate that my opposition to, to Schaefer's thesis is not in any way, shape, or form to be taken as a principled rejection of the idea of interactions between Jews and Christians in late antiquity. Nor does it constitute a fortiori an acceptance of any notions of a pristine Jewish transmission of religious ideas. Sinna iri et studio, for once. I offer here that Schaeffer's theory, as stated, is neither necessary nor plausible in this instance. I will begin and spend quite a time with establishing the ancient apocalyptic blood flowing in the veins and arteries of Metatron. Part two, apocalypse then. In order to begin this reevaluation, we need to think some about the very category of apocalyptic literature. In her most concise and useful introduction to the genre, Martha Himmelfarb has asserted that apocalypses quote, present themselves as revelations to a great hero of the past mediated by an angel. The revelations typically take the form of symbolic visions of history, journeys through the heavens, or some combination of the two, end quote. 
Beginning with the pioneering work of Michael Stone and Jonathan Z. Smith in the 1970s, we have observed a sharp turn in the study of apocalyptic texts, one in which we no longer think of apocalyptic or apocalypticism as the product of particular movements within Jewry, but rather as part and parcel of Jewish thinking in the Second Temple period and beyond. Right? So, <coughs> so not particular movements, but an integral part of, uh, of Jewish thinking. In his book on the origins of Judaism, Philip Davies takes up this new direction and begins his wonderfully instructive chapter on apocalyptic by discussing in brief the, in, the invention of the abstract term apocalyptic as a noun and indicating the three components that it is held to subsume under that rubric a genre of literature, a particular perspective on eschatology, and a social movement. As Davies properly remarks, if these three entities cannot be maintained, and he will show that they cannot, the notion of apocalyptic itself would be nonsensical. Right? That's a quotation. What Davies compellingly argues is that there's absolutely no reason in the world to imagine separate apocalyptic communities in Second Temple Palestine. To be sure, we have a genre, but not an ideology such as that which might constitute separatist communities or cells, as generally it seems predicated by scholarship that refers to apocalyptic as a noun. Despite its currently popular usage, heavily under the influence of New Testament scholarship no less, apocalypse, as per its translation, revelation, does not mean the end of the world, but a revelation of esoteric knowledge by means of an angelic revealer. As has been noted, it includes such knowledge as the origins of the universe, the interpretation of natural phenomena, the historic, historiographical schemata, the succession of empires in Daniel, as well as, for many of the texts in this genre, but not all, eschatological speculation. As Davies comments, quote, the conventions of the genre itself imply the belief in the existence and accessibility of heavenly secrets, which enable one to understand, sometimes to predict, earthly phenomena. But as he continues and emphasizes, but that belief was so widespread in the ancient world that it cannot possibly be said to characterize apocalypses, nor to define a particular apocalyptic worldview. Abandoning the fruitless search for the origins of so-called apocalyptic in the Palestinian prophetic tradition, Davies links to a line of thought that connects it with the Babylonian mantic tradition and sees it primarily as a form of wisdom that is engaged in the deciphering of signs, dreams, and omens. We need not therefore, he concludes, speak of a particular apocalyptic worldview, nor of apocalyptic conventicles, but of the apocalypses as extensions of an entirely normative set of scribal wisdom practices, well over a millennium old by the time we find them in one Enoch and Daniel, conventionally listed as the two earliest uh, apocalypses. This very reasonable and very plausible scenario enables first Davies and then us to perceive connections that otherwise would be missed. For instance, for Davies, the connection between the apocalypses of the first century, such as Four Ezra and Two Baruch, with somewhat earlier texts, such as the wisdom of Ben Sira. These are connections which, although they have been noted, have not been sufficiently applied to understanding of the historical picture, owing to the fact that the latter, that is Ben Sira, has not been read as so-called apocalyptic because it is not eschatological. Not irrelevant here are certain connections that I have brought out in much earlier work between the prologue to John, Ben Sira, and the two late first century AD apocalypses for Ezra and to Baruch. Referring to the past failed attempts of the Logos to enter the world that are detailed in the fourth gospel, I compared them to the successful attempt of wisdom to come into the world via Torah that we find in Ben Sirah. Such intertextual connections can now 
moreover, be traced in the similitudes of Enoch. Wisdom did not find a place where she might dwell, so her dwelling was in the heavens. Wisdom went forth to dwell among the sons of man, but she did not find a dwelling. Wisdom returned to her place and sat down in the midst of the angels. I think uh, for this crowd, I don't need to in any way even uh, suggest the echoes with the opening of the, of the fourth gospel. The authors of the Hermeneia commentary, Nicholsburg and Vanderkam, remark that this poem looks like a negative counter to Ben Sirah 24, 7 to 11. They, however, treat this oppositional stance as the product of an alleg alleged opposition on the part of Ben Sirah to quote unquote apocalypticism and the Enoch text as an anti-Torah polemic. It is more productive, however, I think, to think of these texts as being in a single conversation among circles of wisdom scribes, some of which asserted the success of Torah in bringing wisdom down from her home on high, and others that asserted the failure of that entry of wisdom into the world. One can, earth, can imagine certainly a view that would look around, see how the world was going, and how folks were behaving, and consider the Torah a failure without being opposed to Torah in principle at all. Indeed, by my lights and looking around the world today, the attempt of wisdom to enter the world via the incarnation was a similar failure. Compare, for instance, 4 Ezra 7.72, quote, For this reason, therefore, those who dwell on earth shall be tormented, because though they had understanding, they committed iniquity, and though they received the commandments, they did not keep them, and though they obtained the law, they dealt unfaithfully with what they received. The author of this ap apocalypse is certainly not representing an anti-Torah sort of Jewish thought. Finally, the Gospel of John, one of the main loci for the story of wisdoms, that is the Logos' descent and reascent to heaven, is not in any way anti-Torah or anti-Mosaic, but cites only the failure of the Torah to actually change people's behavior in terms almost identical to those of 4 Ezra. Has not God given you the Torah? And none of you does the Torah. John 7, 19. There seems little reason, therefore, to regard the instantiations and apocalypses of wisdom's failure to enter the world as evidence for sectarianism or an anti-Torah apocalyptic sectarian group or conventicles. As Davies has written, the social background of apocalyptic writing thus furnished is more fully described and precisely documented by the activity of politically established and cultural cosmopolitan scribes than a visionary counter-establishment conventicles, right? In other words, this is not some sort of marginal or um, sectarian uh, literature, but literature from the very center of um, wisdom scribal uh, circles. I think that this perspective can be further advanced via the work of Annette Yoshiko Reed on the Book of the Watchers. Her second chapter is entitled, From Scribalism to Sectarianism, the Angelic Descent Myth and the Social Setting of Enochic Pseudepigraphy. In this chapter, Reed asks some vitally important and central questions about the Book of the Watchers. Quote, most scholars infer that the apocalypse emerged from a scribal milieu. Important questions, however, remain unanswered. Should we imagine these scribes as a closed group of apocalypticists, visionaries, or Enochians who can be readily distinguished from other Jews? Or should we see their distinctive interests and concerns as part of a broader continuum of quote-unquote normative ideologies in the third century BCE, reflecting ongoing discussions about knowledge, purity, and piety within a single scribal discourse? And most importantly, what was their relationship to the Jerusalem temple and to the tradents responsible for the continued transmission of the texts that it would eventually, excuse me, form the Tanakh, end quote. Reed begins to answer these questions by reminding us that we really know very little about Judaism in the third century BC 
and then that the bulk of scholarship infers a description of that identity on the basis of the reception history of one Enoch itself. She shows how scholars read from the exclusion of these texts from both rabbinic Tanakh and most Christian Old Testaments, excepting the Ethiopian Bible, that they were produced on the margins of an imagined mainstream Judaism. In other words, by the time you have a canon of the, of the Hebrew Bible, one Enoch is not in it. In the main, or, or the, the, uh, the uh, uh, canons of most Christian churches, one Enoch does not appear. Therefore, it must have been produced by a marginal uh, group from the mainstream uh, 500, 600 years earlier. Uh, exaggeration, 300 years earlier. This inference is, as Reed compellingly claims and shows, entirely unwarranted. And she also establishes that the interests of later Jews who have received the text may very well have been quite different from those who produced it. Indeed, now that we know that parts of one Enoch were extant and seemingly widely read in Hebrew and Aramaic as late as the first century AD, we know this from Qumran, the argument for the sectarian nature of these texts becomes ever more untenable. In addition, Pierre Luigi Piovanelli showed some years ago that the similitudes of Enoch, the latest part of the collection, probably first century AD, was also not written from a sectarian stance. Part three, weather reports on Metatron and meteorology. In an important early paper published in 1975, J.Z. Smith wrote, apocalypticism cannot be reduced to a mere catalog of elements such as secret or heavenly books, journeys to heaven by a sage, as these motifs can be found within the archaic religions of the Near East and are typical for all modes of Hellenistic religiosity. End quote. Et cetera, in his uh, quote there, crucially comprises here secrets of the heaven and meteorology, etc. As with Smith's own response to Betts, in which he agrees with everything except for the use of the term syncretism, I, in turn, tend to agree with most of what Smith has to say in this paper, except for the term apocalypticism. We do not need to posit, I think, a movement, a movement called apocalypticism in order to make great use of the following insight which I think has not been paid enough attention to. Smith wrote, Berossus was a learned Babylonian priest during the Seleucid period at a time when the Babylonian schools were world famous and the major activities of a Babylonian intellectual were astronomy, astrology, mathematics, historiography, and the recovery of, ancient, of archaic ritual lore. These Babylonian intellectuals, for all the novelty of their speculation, which would culminate in the rich literature of Greco-Egyptian astro Greek astronomy and astrology and the rich philosophical school of Stoicism stood in continuity with ancient Babylonian scribalism, an unbroken tradition from the Sumerian period to the sages of the Babylonian Talmud. Right? A direct connection, argues Smith, between the Amoraim of Babel, the Jewish sages, and ancient uh, Babylonian uh, wisdom, uh, scribal wisdom traditions. This is going to be uh, a very important. Uh, uh, let me add, I don't think I have, I have anywhere in the written form of the text uh, that uh, Markham Geller has been bringing this out by close, close study of medical lore in the Talmud, showing that there are two bodies of tradition that actually contradict each other in many respects, a Greco-Roman body of medical tradition that appears in the Talmud, and also a Babylonian, uh, ancient Babylonian medical tradition. So certainly the medical lore uh, seems to have roots in ancient Akkadian uh, literature, ancient cuneiform literature. As I've hinted above, I hold that one does not need to search for the origins of apocalypticism, for the connections with the Babylonian scribal wisdom are sufficient to explain the tradition. And apocalypticism was, of course, in quotation marks. Uh, 
It is vitally important, as I have said above, to distinguish clearly between apocalyptic and eschatology. The latter may be, and in certain situations is incorporated in the former, but there may certainly be and is apocalyptic literature that is not eschatological at all. It seems all to depend on the political situation. It is also important to note that Smith, as some other scholars following in his wake, do not so much posit a connection between wisdom and apocalyptic as a breaking down of the borders between these abstract categories and attention to the ways that so-called apocalyptic literature is also just a form of wisdom. As we have seen, Peter Schaefer allows that the Bavli and Three Enoch must have had common older sources to work with, but denies any possibility that these earlier sources had any connection with ancient apocalyptic texts or any earlier Palestinian traditions at all. He accordingly concluded once more that instead of regarding Three Enoch, oh, I shouldn't read it a third time. Anyway, I'm a little obsessed with that, right? Because um, having, been, uh, uh, having had ascribed to me explicitly in his footnotes, um, you know, that's such a ridiculous, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like a sore tooth, you know, you just keep uh, sticking, you know, coming back to it with your tongue. So discreetly, right? Some scholars in the body of the text then gives a footnote and cites three papers of mine in which I make absolutely no such. Um, no, okay. While I entirely, this is sin, this is me when I'm sin era at studio, right? <laughs> While I entirely agree, of course, that Metatron does not lie in the background of Christology, I find Schaefer's own proposal equally as problematic and wonder at his neglect of a third model, namely that what we have in the Bavli and in Sefer Hechalot, or Three Enoch, represents the bricolage of a tradition developed out of Babylonian wisdom and old Jewish scribal traditions paralleling the developments that we have come to call Christianity, which, as I have said, is not to deny the possibility of cross-fertilization between these traditions. It is simply, I submit, not the case that the traditions of the so-called pseudepigraphic literature had no legs in later Jewish writing and were only preserved in Christian circles. But you'll find this in every handbook. I would propose that these traditions remain vital among Jews without making any absolutely clear distinction between the rabbis and other Jews on this point. Imagining that alongside of other developments within late ancient Jewish culture, various forms of thinking and imagining that were extant in the earlier, earlier apocalypses also continued and developed new forms interacting in different ways with other streams of rabbinic and para-rabbinic tradition including those that sought to suppress those apocalyptic traditions. In this context, the connections between Enoch and other ancient Babylonian scribal wisdom, namely the traditions about the seventh antediluvian king, Emma Duranki, find their most important scholarly context in establishing the likelihood that the roots of so-called apocalyptic and the later Jewish Babylonian traditions are in Babylonian scribal wisdom. As pointed out by Vanderkam, and then developed further by Andrei Orloff, the connections between this seventh king and special knowledge of omens and divination are explicit. Given his demonstrated connections with Enoch then, seeing Babylonian omen wisdom at the root of these traditions seems not at all a step too far. As Olaf points out, moreover, the fact that the secret information imparted to Enma Duranki comes from the gods of weather is not to be sneezed at either. And we'll see that that actually becomes a crucial part of the argument. In his article, The Historical Setting of the Hebrew Book of Enoch, Philip Alexander argues that Enoch's transformation into divine son of man in the parables of one Enoch, and especially in two Enoch, enabled the later Merkabah and Kabbalistic identifications of Enoch with Metatron, the highest of the angels, concluding that if such a development had not taken place, Enoch could never have been identified with the archangel Metatron. In other words, 
if Enoch had not become the son of man in one Enoch and two Enoch, he could not have become Metatron in the uh, um, later three Enoch. If this be the case, and Schaefer has not produced any argument against it, the continuity between two and three Enoch, and thus the passage in the Talmud as well, is further established. We can thus take the roots of that transformation back to one Enoch, that is to the parables of Enoch, or the uh, similitudes, and emphasize the generativity of that transformation in the production of both rabbinic, para-rabbinic, and Christian Jewish Christology. As Alexander concludes, we must postulate in consequence an historical link between the Hechalot mystics and the circles which generated these pseudepigraphic Enoch traditions. The advantage of the new models for thinking about so-called apocalyptic is that we no longer need to posit historical links between groups of people widely separated in time and space, right? You know, about thousand year lines of transmission that were underground but rather can think of continued transmission of themes in scribal wisdom circles, of which, as J.Z. Smith has suggested, the sages of the Babylonian Talmud were part. The hypothesis of a genetic relationship, or better, a genealogical relationship, between the Son of Man of the Gospels and Metatron of late ancient Judaism is thus well-founded, in my opinion, a genetic or genealogical. Neither is the father of the other, right? Jesus is not the father of Metatron. Metatron is not the father of Jesus. But both are descended from the same one like a son of man. There is a further, to my mind, decisive clue in these matters. Namely, the fact that the context within which the Enoch Metatron tradition is cited in the Bavli itself is in close textual connection with rabbinic traditions regarding the seven heavens and meteorological phenomena. Although the fact itself of the connection of these latter with ancient apocalypses has been noted, its importance has not been sufficiently emphasized until now. Itamar Grunwald particularly remarks that one Enoch is very invested in the revelation of cosmological and natural phenomena. While apocalypses composed somewhat later than that one manifest much less curiosity on this score. In the Bavli, Chagiga, we find an elaborate account of the seven heavens, together with flamboyant interest in cosmological and meteorological phenomena, such as are found in the parables of Enoch and to Enoch, cheek by jowl with the Metatron speculation. Right? <clears throat> so what, I, what I'm saying is that the, the fact that one Enoch and two, two Enoch both involve... Uh, uh, narratives of journeys through the seven heavens, discussion of the weather, you know, where does snow come from, where does uh, lightning come from, etc., and then descriptions of the, of the Godhead um, in the form of uh, Enoch, the son of man, and the same pro propinquity, the same... Uh, um, uh, sequence occurs in the passage of the Talmud is itself a very strong and hitherto unnoticed argument for the dependence of the late Talmudic text on traditions uh, that go back to uh, one and two Enoch from the first century. This is moreover not an accidental propinquity in the Talmud. As Raymond Leich has remarked, Bavli Chagiga 11b 16a surely presents us with a skillfully designed sugiya that conveys a surprisingly coherent image of the cosmos. I have already remarked above that cosmology appears very closely with theosophy in earlier apocalyptic texts. As Orloff also points out, this interest in cosmological matters was also deeply characteristic of the Mesopotamian and Meduranki traditions. It seems, therefore, no coincidence that in Bavli Chagiga, the cosmological matter and the eminently theosophical narratives about the throne and Metatron appear together, and that a tradition, not of course necessarily written, linking this pericope in the Bavli to earlier motifs in the Enoch tradition 
may plausibly be hypothesized. As Orloff shows, this interest in the workings of nature leads to a different sort of angelology in Sefer Hechelot than we find in other Hechelot works. That together with the very fact of the centrality of Enoch in Sefer Hechelot and only in Sefer Hechelot among the Hechelot texts renders its connections of one sort or another with the Enoch traditions quite plausible. The cosmological and meteorological connection with the Bavli gives us a chain of traditions that it is hard to deny. I suggest that the fact of the close and non-trivial literary proximity within the Talmudic tractate of cosmological material and Enoch Metatron material suggests continuity between these two corpora. It would be perverse to imagine that precisely the same concatenation of themes happened to have come into being twice. We must assume some kind of line of transmission by which these traditions were kept alive, perhaps among Byzantine, Greek, and Hebrew writing Jews, that is, in, in the Byzantine Empire, there were Jews who wrote Greek and Hebrew, and uh, used both languages. We have very little of their literature in Greek, but uh, they could very easily have been the conduit by which um, such apocalyptic traditions were kept alive. Perhaps then the same or similar lines of transmission that arrived at Sinkelis the monk as well. We need not posit a Christus ex machina to explain this at all. This line of argument will be the main subject of the next lecture and developed at length there. What is important right now is to see how the newer approaches to apocalyptic per se inflect this claim. Once we realize that apocalyptic material is not to be identified with eschatology, and more significantly that there is no necessity to posit apocalyptic groups or conventicles, but rather to see here precisely the continuation of ancient Babylonian scribal traditions that spread around the ancient world east and west and persisted well into the Seleucid period, there is no reason in the world to imagine, I think, that this material, particularly as impacted by canonical Daniel and Enoch traditions, could not have reached the wisdom scribes of Babylon, whom we know of as the rabbis too, along with, as well, various other bits and bobs of such Babylonian wisdom involve, involving uh, medicine. If this be the case for medicine, why not for meteorology as well? And if for meteorology, why not cosmology? And if for cosmology, why not for other forms of Babylonian speculation such as theosophy? We can ask and leave open to what degree this is a matter of drawing a specific line from Babylonian scribalism to Enoch and related materials, and to what degree is this a matter of recovering a more pervasive and continually productive Babylonian intellectual heritage for Jewish cultural production more broadly, as exemplified by this or that text or genre, but not limited to them. Following Geller in this regard, I would prefer taking the evidence of Babylonian science from Qumran, alongside evidence of the continued vitality of ancient Near Eastern magical and medicinal traditions in the Talmud, as signaling a whole broad range of different types of connections between Babylonian scribalism and Jewish thought only seemingly strange to us now because of the scholarly tendency to bracket ancient Near Eastern influence as pre-exilic and look to Greek or Roman background to explain late Second Temple trends, ignoring largely the data for the continued vitality of Babylonian traditions during and even after the Seleucids. To put the point differently and perhaps more pointedly, we can and should accept Sholem's insight that the combination of theosophy and cosmology in these two bodies of literature suggests a priori a strong historical nexus between them without having to resort to his highly implausible assertions of, quote, a religious movement of distinctive character and unbroken transmission from the alleged anonymous conventicles of the old apocalyptics through the Tanaim to the Merkava of Byzantine and later times. The bottom line of my intervention is that rather than seeing the Bavli's apocalyptically themed materia, especially as found in Tractate Chagiga, as coming from only one source, 
or as only having been developed, invented as a Jewish answer to a fully formed and fully separated Christianity, as Schaefer would have it, we should see it and three Enoch as being a sort of stew of ancient apocalyptic traditions transmitted inter alia via texts such as two Enoch as well, Byzantine speculations, including Christological ones, Babylonian scribal wisdom, both old and new, and other forms of Jewish speculation as attested in such texts as magic bowls and occasionally glimpsed between the lines of rabbinic literature as well. Different portions of this stew were, moreover, abandoning the metaphor, shaped and reshaped, framed and reframed, to serve the rhetorical and other purposes of the different groups and individuals who produced these fascinating texts. Both the synchronic contexts and the historical linkages are of great scholarly interpretive historical interest and neither should be given short shrift. Some final remarks. This revised understanding of apocalyptic literature per se sets up the intervention that I wish to make here in an important discussion having to do with the origins of certain literary phenomena in later, especially Babylonian Jewish texts, namely those texts called the Hechalot literature, as well as certain Talmudic congeners of them. The backstory is by now well known. After a century of neglect and contempt for these texts on the part of the scholars of the Wissenschaftes Judentums movement, Gerhard Scholem, later Gershom Shalom, rescued them from infamy, in part by claiming greater antiquity for them than had been supposed, and in part by claiming direct connections for them from earlier, especially Second Temple apocalyptic texts. This perspective was further developed by Scholem's student Itamar Grunwald. Another generation of scholars led by their master, Peter Schaefer, contested Scholem's major trends strenuously on various grounds, indicting a much sharper and definitive break between anything that the Second Temple texts had to offer and anything that shows up in the later rabbinic and para-rabbinic works. I offer that a non-sectarian approach to the Enoch materials, eschewing the notion that they were produced by separate apocalyptic conventicles, allows for an easier sense of how these traditions might have circulated among Jews both earlier and later. That is to say, recognizing the more central and non-sectarian nature of the apocalyptic texts, as well as their connections with literatures of Jewish elites, obviates the necessity to search for or posit underground lines of transmission of these ideas. In the next lecture, we will examine here evidence that has been hidden in plain sight, as it were, for the continued vitality of apocalypse-like traditions throughout the classical rabbinic period, and argue that the historical developments of these traditions, while perhaps not sufficient to explain the Hechalot, are also necessary for such an explanation. At the same time, we will see that we most certainly do not need to imagine or reconstruct any tra Tanaitic traditions of ascent or descent to the chariot in order to make sense of the evidence that we have. Thank you. <laughs>